All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's listening session. Good afternoon. My name is Kiki Hubbard, and I'm the Director of Advocacy and Communications for Organic Seed Alliance. I'm joined today by my coworker, uh, Kathleen McCluskey, our Outreach Director, who will be co-moderating today's event with me. We are also joined by our, our colleague and co-host, Amy Wong, with Friends of Family Farmers. Amy will be presenting some important information today on the topic at hand to help set the stage for today's conversation. With us too is Rihanna Symes with Cultivate Oregon and Jeff Shazinski with NCAT, both of whom will be moderating the chat box throughout this event. So thank you, Jeff, Rihanna, and Amy for joining us today. I also want to thank our co-hosts of this event, and we have several. They include the National Center for Appropriate Technology, NCAT, Our Family Farms, OSU Extension Small Farms Program, Friends of Family Farmers, and Oregonians for Safe Farms and Families. All of these partners have provided incredible support in planning, promoting, and executing today's listening session. So thank you again to our co-hosts. I know I speak for all of these partners when I say how much we appreciate all of you joining us and taking a break from your day to engage in this conversation. This is a topic that is rather complex and nuanced, but one that we all feel is very important in the context of organic seed integrity. With the challenges presented by the current pandemic and with a new administration taking control tomorrow, it's more important than ever that we create virtual gatherings like this one for timely discussions to inform policy recommendations moving forward. Today's listening session is being recorded and it's part of a series that OSA has been co-hosting with our partners throughout this past fall and winter. The previous sessions were on the topics of intellectual property rights in seed and ex excluded methods in organic production. Both of these recordings are available to stream on NCAT's website and I'm going to pop the links into the chat box here shortly so that you can look at them after this listening session if you desire. Right now, I'm going to hand over the mic to Kathleen, and she's going to help us um, walk through some directions on how you all can participate in today's event. Kat? Great. Thanks, Kiki. And again, thanks uh, to everyone who's joining us this afternoon. Um, before we go any further, I'm going to take a minute or two to make sure that everyone who's joining us live understands how to participate in the listening session. So there's three ways to do that. First and foremost, you'll have a chance to provide verbal comments up to three minutes. Um, to speak, you'll need to click on the raised hand feature located near the question box as pictured here on your screen. <clears throat> and I'll be keeping a queue of hands raised and invite you to unmute yourself after your name is called and make your comment or ask your question. And then after your comment, you can please unmute or excuse me, please mute yourself and lower your hand. And our friends at NCAT are going to be keeping a timer and will poli politely ask you to wrap up if you go over time. We'll try to get to everybody today and I will do my best to call on folks in order of hands raised. Now, for those of you who are joining us by phone and not looking at a screen, you can still raise your hand to provide comments. And you do this by entering star nine into your phone. And to unmute yourself, you can hit star six. Because I won't be able to see your name, I'll call on you by telephone number when it's your time in the queue to give your comment. Now, secondly, throughout this event, you may type your comments or questions into the chat box feature. And you can use this throughout the event also as an opportunity to connect with other participants. Lastly, following the event, you'll receive a very short survey that allows you to submit additional comments that you may not have gotten a chance to type or say during today's listening session. All right, <clears throat> with that, let's get started. We are going to start by getting a sense of who's in the room with us today. Um, and in just a moment, you should see a poll pop up on your screen. And um, please take a moment to let us know which of these in this list best describes you. And I want to name that we know folks wear many, many hats, uh, but please choose the one option that best describes you. Thanks, Marianne, for the poll. And we'll give this about 30 seconds or so. So 
Just another moment. Great, and we'll wrap it up. And our partners at NCAT will share the results so we can all get a sense of who is in the room. Um, for those of you joining us by phone, we've got uh, about 21% of uh, participants are farmers, 15% gardeners, 17% nonprofits, 13% university researchers. And I see we're also joined by several seed growers, seed companies, plant breeders, and some organic certifiers. Wonderful, thank you. Welcome again to everybody. Um, next I'm gonna introduce, I'd like to introduce Amy Wong with Friends of Family Farmers uh, who partners with Organic Seed Alliance on a new Pacific Northwest seed integrity project that today's listening session is part of. Um, the project aims to develop meaningful policies that protect organic and conventional non-GE seed growers from the threat of genetically engineered crops from British Columbia down to Oregon. And collaborators are working on a seed integrity policy platform with a focus on local and state initiatives informed by current advocacy efforts in the region, seed producer surveys, today's listening session, and shaped by a new coalition of seed activists. The long-term goal of this project is to foster sustained coalition engagement and contamination threat reporting in the region. So please be in touch with OSA and Friends of Family Farmers if you are interested in getting involved or if you'd like to learn more. Uh, Amy, who joins us this afternoon, arrived in Oregon in 2010 to attend law school at Lewis and Clark, where she earned a certificate in environment and natural resources law with a focus on regenerative agriculture. Amy previously advocated on behalf of coalition of nonprofit organizations seeking legislative and agency protections for Oregon's vegetable specialty seed industry. I'm gonna turn it over to Amy, who is going to be summarizing some recent legislative and other seed advocacy efforts to protect seed stocks from GE contamination in Oregon as well as providing us a brief overview of efforts in other states. Amy? Thank you so much for that intro, Kat. And thank you again to Organic Seed Alliance and Kat and our other co-hosts for having me here today. It's really an honor. And while I work on multiple food and ag policies for Friends of Family Farmers, seed policy is really near and dear to my heart and something I've been around for over 10 years and working concertedly on for about five. That said, I am not a farmer or a seed breeder, and I'm really thrilled to be able to listen to all of you today to get some wonderful feedback to really go into our regional policy platform. Um, you can go ahead and advance to the next slide. And I will say, I usually like much less words on my slides, but these are busier slides and you don't need to worry about getting all the information because it is in the paper that I wrote for last year's organic seed conference, the proceedings paper. Uh, and it's on pages 73 to 78. So please don't worry about cramming all this information down. Um, I can always get it to you and I'll drop my email in the chat box when I'm done. To, so feel free to reach out at any time. But like Kat was saying, we are really excited to put together the together this regional seed policy platform. We know that we need input to create a realistic regulatory scheme to protect against contamination and ideally increase organic and non-GE seed production. We need more data, knowledge, tales from the field, firsthand experience. We know we need guidance from the seed community to create a viable path forward. And while taking weak political realities and powerful opposition into account. So I know I'm speaking to preaching to the choir in some senses about why this work is so important, uh, but the pandemic has really shown us that we need robust regional food systems that prioritize or at the very least meaningfully safeguard nutrient dense food sources, not chemical intensive commodity crops. And of course, diversified organic farming takes environmental and other externalities into better account, leading to healthier soils, among other benefits. Uh, next slide, please. 
So why this work is so important in the Pacific Northwest is that it's the fifth best vegetable seed producing region in the world, yet there's no protections. Uh, federal GE regulations are inadequate. There's no statewide regulations in Oregon and the Oregon Department of Agriculture says they don't have to have the authority to regulate outside of plant and pest disease issues. And often these are very short term solutions. Uh, all counties in Oregon except Jackson County are preempted from making decisions about what types of seeds are grown in their jurisdiction. And very recently, the state mediation program was defunded in the current budget uh, crisis. So this is the one thing that the state said they could point to the mediation program as a way for farmers and others to hash out these issues. And now that is gone. Uh, and lastly, there is a ban on growing canola outside of 500 acres in the Willamette Valley. This ban sunsets um, on June 30th, 2023, and it's unclear how this is gonna be resolved, but based on previous canola wars in Oregon, it's gonna be a big fight. So next slide, please. And I'm now gonna give a bit of an overwork of work that has been done in Oregon to prime the pump for our conversation, so to speak. So these are things that have been tried in Oregon and other places. And we'd love to get feedback on what you all think would be good to try again, and what can be done moving forward. So there have been attempts for a total uh, GE ban. There have been specific crop bans. There have been calls for GE cultivation reporting requirements. Uh, there have been calls for grants of authority to the State Department of Ag to establish control areas for GE commodities or to establish reserve areas where GE crops are prohibited. There have been calls to create patent holder liability for GE contamination. And there have been calls to eliminate the statewide seed preemption for the entire state, as well as just for Josephine County, because along with Jackson County, those are the two counties that ran sex successful ballot initiatives against the cultivation of genetically engineered crops. And I'll get into that in a bit too. Um, and there has been canola attempts, one to outright ban canola, and then as well as to at least limit it to 500 acres. And that, that, that has been successful. Uh, next slide, please. So some of Oregon's history, canola has been around the Willamette Valley for decades and now runs concurrent with other threats to organic seed production. And really it was 2013 and 2019 that the, there was going to be sunsets on the amount of canola that could be grown in the state. So those were the two years that the caps were put in place. Um, in 2012, though, in Southern Oregon, Rogue Valley seed growers began experiencing coexistence issues with GE sugar beet seed growers. And uh, SASCA, the Southern Oregon Seed Growers Association, tried to uh, bring everybody to the table to come up with a solution. But unfortunately, the GE industry was not able to work with the organic and other seed growers. And that led to Jackson and Josephine County putting ballot initiatives onto their ballots for, to ban the cultivation of genetically engineered crops. Jackson County filed first, but Josephine County had every intention of also filing a ballot initiative. But when the biotech industry got wind of these ballot initiatives, they ran up to Salem and in a special session in 2013 with very little notice, like one hour, they were able to ram through as part of a bill otherwise unrelated to agriculture, a seed preemption bill which only exempted Jackson County because their ballot initiative had been filed at that time. In 2014, both Jackson and Josephine County ballot initiatives were successful, but unfortunately, because Josephine County wasn't included in the exemption, they were immediately preempted. So 2015, there was some work on GE issues, but it was really in 2017 that the legislative work began in earnest in terms of trying to undo the preemption as well as to create liability for GE contamination. Uh, this continued into 2019, and there is a bill this session to try and undo the legislation in Josephine County to undo that preemption. But like many legislatures around the country right now, they are totally 
enmeshed in dealing with COVID-19 for many on the West Coast, wildfires, racial equity, and of course, budget shortfalls. So it, we may be waiting until we have a regional policy platform in place to really push it, but we'll see. Um, so we can move to the next slide, please. When we look at what has been done elsewhere, and again, there's a lot more information on this on pages 73 to 78 in the proceedings from last year's SEED conference. Um, in 2019, the New York Senate passed a bill which was similar to our GE liability law, but in reverse in that it would have created an affirmative defense for farmers who have been contaminated. So they aren't liable for an intellectual property violation if the amount of the contamination is above 1%, the threshold that was set in the Osgata case. But this only passed the Senate, not the House. So it's not law. And it sounds like it's been before the New York legislature before, probably is again, or will be in the future. Um, and in 2019, Vermont mandated the creation of a committee to review GE seed traits. And this is exciting. Um, of course, it will depend on who is on that committee, but, but I think that this is something that could be useful moving forward, at least something that is, can be pointed to. And if you know of any legislative efforts or any other things that you'd like to bring to our attention, please do so. As we are creating that regional policy plan, of course, we'll start doing some research, but it's hard to stay on top of everything in all states, let alone the world. Um, there's also myriad county and city GE bans. There are control areas and protected districts. As I was saying before, sometimes these aren't the most time, they can be time bound, so they're not the most sustainable solutions mandatory disclosure of GE cultivation, voluntary mapping and pinning, mandatory and voluntary management practices, sometimes known as BMPs, and a variety of coexistence approaches, which we wanna hear about from you, what you think works. Next slide, please. And when we look further afield, I think Portugal has a really comprehensive approach. It goes far above standard EU regulations which are for coexistence, which are far better than anything I've seen in the United States. Um, it requires training, notification, and data management for GE growers, GE free zones, a compensation system for farmers who can demonstrate economic harm, and this fund is financed by taxes applied to GE seed packaging. And GE growers can be held civilly liable if they do not comply with these regulations. Next slide, please. So we've seen all of these efforts that have largely been unsuccessful to date. And why is that? And we know that it's because our opposition, largely the biotech industry and conventional ag sources are very very well funded, are in lockstep with each other, and basically have had decades of unfettered access to decision makers. So we really need to build a strong coalition and a long-term plan if we want to be strong in advocating for these issues. Um, they're concerned that we will drive out biotech, create a hostile environment for tech and business development, will flood the courts with frivolous lawsuits. And of course, there's a libertarian perspective that runs through this, which in my opinion and others is very much at odds with the spirit of coexistence. So next slide, please. So what is next? We know that working successfully in legislatures takes skill, resources, and legislative champions who understand the issue and will go to bat for it. We need data and firsthand testimony. We need coalition building and fundraising. We really need the seed community's backing. We need to bring in new allies like we've done in Oregon with the state Grange. We need to highlight how growing organic and non-GE seed economies can create better post-pandemic food security and rural economic development. We need more organic friendly legislators. Uh, we need more state organic action plans. And this is exciting because uh, Friends of Family Farmers is working on one in Oregon and we have already identified co contamination concerns as part of that plan. Um, we need to amend the damaging laws on the books. 29 states also have seed preemption laws and we need to try and undo or at least mitigate the damage 
posed by those laws. We need patience. This is a long game, but it's an important game. And we need campaign finance reform to help undo the powerful lobbies that, that harm our, our efforts. And really we need to listen and learn from those in the field. So with that, I am going to thank you again for having me um, turn it back over to Kat. And again, I'll put my email in the chat box and feel free to reach out at any time. Thank you again. Thank you, Amy. Your experience and knowledge in these issues is truly invaluable. And again, is so helpful in setting the stage for today's conversation. We're now going to move into the open forum component of today's listening session. We have a full hour um, to hear from all of you joining us today. We'll use as much of that time as we need to. And Amy has agreed to field questions. So in addition to providing comments today, please also feel free to direct questions to Amy as they pertain to the short presentation that she just provided. We're sharing some questions with you all on the screen here. Don't feel obligated to stick to these questions as part of your comments. We're simply sharing these to help jumpstart the conversation. And for those of you who are not in front of a screen and only joining us by phone, I'm going to read them out loud before getting started. The questions include, have you been impacted by GMO contaminated seed and how? Have you been financially harmed by GMO contaminated seed? Have you reported or sought recourse for these events? What does coexistence mean to you? What does it look like? Are there examples at state and or international levels that we might consider? Examples that go beyond those that Amy just shared in her presentation. Do you believe the federal regulatory framework for GMOs is adequate? What would you need, especially if you're a seed producer, from a state level framework to ensure the integrity of the seed that you grow, buy, or sell? And with that, we're going to get started, but just a few reminders. As Kat shared before, please remember to raise your hand using the raise hand button by the chat box. And remember to unmute yourself when you're called on and also introduce yourself. When you're finished giving comments, please put yourself back on mute and lower your hand after you complete your comments. And again, you'll have three minutes to speak. So with that, let's get started. I'm gonna turn it over to Kat who's starting us off with the queue. Great. Thanks, Kiki. And thanks, Amy, for that fantastic overview. Folks, again, can go ahead and begin raising your hand. If you're calling in by phone, the raise hand function is star nine. And if at any point here you have a, an issue with um, navigating that raise hand feature or it's not working for you, you can just go ahead and pop that in the chat box and we can call on you. Um, you can also message me directly in that chat box function and I can add you to the queue. Um, Amy, do you wanna go ahead and share that definition of preemption just verbally? Uh, there was a question in the chat box for clarification on what that means, what it means to be preempted. Yes, absolutely, I'm happy to. So it basically means at either, usually it comes from federal law and a federal law would best or preempt a state law. But then in this context, in terms of Oregon, the Oregon state law, which applies to all counties, bests a county law, unless it was specifically exempted. So because Jackson County was specifically exempted, their law can go forward. But any other county in Oregon is, unable to move forward with a law like that because the state law is preempting or besting that and it's it's a problematic ceiling so um, I hope that explains it does that make sense yeah thank you Amy and folks remember too uh, that if you have other questions specifically for Amy on what she presented clarification or definition needs that is fair game. And Amy is gonna be, of course, staying on throughout the listening session. So don't be shy if you would like some more clarification. There's likely others on the phone or online looking for it. Um, Briata, or excuse me, Biata, you are next, or I see your hand up. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. And if you could introduce yourself quickly before making your comment, and please, please, uh, 
for everybody. If I mispronounce your name, please do correct me. Hello, my name is Beata Sosi. I'm from Northern New Mexico. I'm a tribal member of Santa Clara Pueblo. Um, I work with a nonprofit called Table Women United. And we're also members of the New Mexico Food and Seed Sovereignty Alliance um, that have done a lot of foundational work in our state in the past um, and mobilizing to prevent seed preemption and um, pass a lot of tribal um, resolutions, state memorials, uh, county resolutions um, and protection of heirloom seeds. Um, and so I'm conscious of the fact that, you know, we need to put these resolutions into actual tribal constitutional law and also um, in the state and making more GE, making GE free zones a reality at a county and city level here in New Mexico um, as a next step for that work that we've done in the past. Um, I think I, you know, that, that work with the, the languaging on the resolutions that we've used with the New Mexico Food and Seed Sovereignty Declaration that is open language that other communities are able to use. Um, and, you know, as a way to just kind of gauge support in your community, but to build off of, um, as far as policy, it's language that has gone far and wide um, from New Mexico since then. And I'm happy to share that with folks um, if you need if you need to look at it. Um, so I guess I'm interested in any kind of policy roadmap guidelines on how to enact a GE free zone at a municipal or county level, um, because we have that foundational work pretty much intact here in New Mexico. Um, I'd also like to advocate for more centering of indigenous perspectives and moving forward with, with seed work and honoring seeds as integral to the rights of indigenous peoples. Um, I don't like to use the word cultural property, but it is our cultural living relations with a lot of the seeds and things that we're speaking of. Um, and so how are we centering indigenous communities in this restorative work um, and protective work, the same way we would talk about protecting land and water as a way to protect seeds, but like um, how can we integrate that consciousness more? Because um, I know this is a, a pretty diverse group on this meeting today. So just want to put it out there that, you know, we're also recognizing that protection of who really has own, um, when we think about, and, and again, not using property or ownership loosely, but knowing, honoring seeds and heirloom seeds as cultural relatives, living cultural relatives of first peoples of these lands. Um, and how does that play into this, this discussion? So I guess that's it for me. Thank you. Yeah, to thank you so much for the, your comments and um, also for sharing, again, that, that centering of, of um, what you named for this conversation, as well as the work that you and um, your colleagues have been doing in New Mexico. If, if folks wanted to, you, you've mentioned that you have language that you would be willing to share um, with others. Yata, is there a, a good way to, what's the best way for folks to get in touch with you who might be interested in following up with you on, on that offer? Sure, um, I'll put my email in the chat box. It's just Beata at tablewomenunited.org. You can also look up the New Mexico Food and Seed Sovereignty Alliance and that declaration is out there. Um, there's a YouTube video of the declaration that I'll also post in the chat. And um, yeah, I mean, that language, we, we really wanna encourage people to roll with that language and, and adapt it as needed in your communities. Thank you so much for for sharing those in the chat. Um, I really appreciate that. And I know others do on the call. And I think, Beata, you had a request. You were asking for if others had 
boilerplate or template language that you all were seeking to, um, I wanna check in with the folks on the call to see if, if you do have um, something to share uh, with Beata, some language that could be helpful, can you either pop it in the chat so we can all see it, or you can go ahead and raise your hand and um, share those details with the group verbally. Yeah, specifically like a template for a GE free ordinance Thank you. Um, or any kind of policy road mapping that has already happened as a way to go about just planning strategically for um, creating GE free zones. Kat, this is Amy and I can jump in and say that I know the Center for Food Safety has done a lot of work both in Hawaii and Oregon and I'm sure potentially other places and would have some of this language and I would be happy to um, put Beata in touch with them after this. Wonderful. Thank you, Amy. Thank you again, Beata. All right, I am not seeing other hands up for comments or questions, but I'm seeing some good conversations happening in the chat. Rihanna, did you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and share some clarifications between, um, I see some conversations going on about transgenics, GE, GMO, either Rihanna or Amy, if you wanna go ahead and respond to that or just uplift it out of the chat so folks on the phone can um, take advantage of that clarification too. Yeah, sure. Um, this is Rihanna with Cultivate Oregon. So there's just a couple comments in the chat and some clarifying about kind of the difference between GE kind of as a or GMO and what's meant by that and which technologies we're referring to. Um, but I won't answer that. I'll pass that either to Amy or to Jeff had a great um, answer if wanted to clarify further. Thank you. Well, uh, this is Jeff. Um, yeah, I've written a publication that I think we're going to reference later, but I tend to think of things as transgenic or cisgenic. I know that those are cumbersome words that often confuse, maybe seem to confuse, but just thinking of transfer of genes between organisms a flounder, a tomato, that's the historic and the traditional one we think of when we're talking about GMOs. But the other one is uh, now is CRISPR, which is cisgenics, which is the manipulation of the genome within a species and, and or actually, and or the insertion of a synthetic, so that may be transgenic because it can make synthetic genes now as well. Now, don't take me too much further than that because I am not a um, plant, this, whatever these people are that do this, I'm a biotechnologist. But, 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 but unfortunately, the cisgenic or the CRISPR has become very popular and become part of actually, in some sense, our vaccines and uh, medical uh, applications. So everybody thinks it's just cool to internally modify the genes. But I would argue that same dangers and same problems exist, whether it's transgenic or cisgenic. I might have took too long, but. That's really helpful, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, I'd argue that you did that very quickly. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, I'm not seeing folks lined up in the queue for comments. Don't be shy. Again, if you have additional questions, I know the chat box is handy, but raising your hand and asking questions or making comments verbally also helps out folks who are going to be watching this as a recording and, other, and also the folks that are joining us by phone. Kat, I want to highlight another question that just popped up in the chat box. And okay, well, Jeff is responding to it. But the question is, when breeders refer to CMS seeds, is that an example of cisgenic? Is it done with CRISPR? And so Jeff responded, I'm not sure what CMS seeds are, nor am I. So uh, I would love it if there's anybody else who could shed some light on this.
I might put one of our participants on the spot here. I see that Dr. Jim Myers is with us. Jim, if you're in a position to answer, I, you are you are my go-to expert on this question and on CMS, I should say, generally. Yes, I'd, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, CMS, cytoplasmic male sterility, is um, it's a genetic incompatibility between the, the nuclear genome and the cytoplasmic genome. genome. And um, it gives you the, the, a male sterility that's used to produce hybrid seed. Um, there are naturally occurring forms of cytoplasmic male sterility. Uh, these um, in particular in, in things like onion and carrots. Um, the forms in brassica and um, chicory have been um, used uh, biotechnology that I wouldn't really call genetic engineering, but um, it, it basically had, they've used uh, protoplast fusion to uh, transfer the um, cytoplasmic genome into the to combine with the nuclear genome in things like your broccoli and cabbage and so forth. Um, so it's and CRISPR has not been involved in any of those processes. I saw that on the it's a question on the chat. Um, I hope, hope that's kind of a thumbnail explanation that's lucid to everyone on this. Maybe 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 that could be then in my terminology cisgenic in the sense that is still a manipulation within a single organism of some kind. So you're internally messing around with the genetics, you're not transferring, but you are in a sense messing around with the genetics in a, in a species, correct or not? Um, you are, but you're not uh, altering the DNA directly. You're combining whole organelles rather than uh, going in and, and snipping out uh, a section of DNA and then transferring it into a different organism. So it's, in my mind, it's a fundamentally different process from trans, transgenesis or cisgenesis. Beyond me, but thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jim. And thanks, Jeff. Jim, I let you go pretty quickly, but Kathy had a follow-up question here, a clarification maybe that she read that in Europe, there was an objection to CMS among organic farmers. Kiki, you may also be able to comment on this, on the status of CMS usage in organic in Europe. Uh, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but they did, uh, they did determine it was excluded, correct? Um, it is, um, well, in Europe, I'm not sure whether that's the case or not, but um, it's, it falls into that, well, I think uh, in the U.S. It's can, it falls into kind of a, a gray area um, in that it is a, it's been an excluded method. The protoplast fusion has been an excluded method. So in the, U yes, in the U.S. National Organic Program and the organic standards, CMS is allowed as long as it's within the same taxonomic family. Yes. In Europe, I believe that it's more strict and that it's not allowed. And in fact, a lot of the biggest breeding firms, including breeding firms for organic growers, have just are, are avoiding CMS to um, comply with with that with that standard. So um, I can I can verify that to confirm and, and pop it into the chat box. That's my understanding. Thank you both. I'll, I'll also add that Kiki at the beginning of the listening session mentioned that this is a series, this is the third of a series of listening sessions that we're holding. And the one prior to this was on excluded methods. Um, and that's methods that are excluded from um, US uh, organics. So that Kiki included a link to that recorded listening session at the top of the chat box. And for folks that are interested in learning more about CMS and other excluded technologies um, from organics, you can find a ton of information in, in that. Um, okay, and just lifting up a question out of the chat box feature to the group here today, and um, someone's looking for a recommendation for a comprehensive 
GE dictionary for the lay person. I will, if, if folks have specific resources, I'd love to hear them. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, but I will also mention that on OSA's website, we have a frequently asked questions glossary section and some of these terms, some terms are included in that, that can be helpful. They're kind of translated and meant for a lay audience. Well, today's listening session does have um, somewhat of an emphasis on the Pacific Northwest, at least as some of these examples um, have been shared. If any of you are representing other parts of the US, grain crops, um, other field crops facing these same issues, we'd love to hear a diversity of voices from different cropping systems to inform both this conversation and our thinking around next steps on these issues. So we'd love to hear from, from other growers as well. And as a reminder to the several people that are joining us by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone. Kiki? Yeah, is that Frank Morton? That's me. Um, just a couple comments since uh, people are sort of dumbstruck here. Um, yes, looking at your questions, sure, I've been impacted by GMO um, contaminated seed. It wasn't my seed that was contaminated, but charred seed in Willamette Valley has been contaminated. Uh, since I grow seeds in the Willamette Valley, that cast a shadow on me. Um, have I been financially harmed by these GMO contamination events? Not me directly, but I incur expenses like having my beaten charred seed uh, tested, which costs money. Um, so it's sort of like a tax in some sense, on being a beet or chard grower in the Willamette Valley. Uh, you have to pay to make sure that your seed has not been contaminated. Um, <clears throat> I'm a member of the, the Seed Association, and I have reported these kinds of things and the, event, the impact it has on me. The response is a shrug of the shoulders. It's like, well, yeah, we all got to test our seed all the time. That's just part of doing business. So that's their attitude. And coexistence around here means that everybody gets to grow the kind of seed they want to. And you need to figure out how to coexist, which basically means uh, finding out what all your neighbors are growing and then you have to take steps to protect yourself. So that's what it looks like in reality. Um, the question of whether we should have GMO free zones, to me, it always presented the conflict of, uh, well, what if I am an organic grower, but I just don't happen to live in a GMO free zone, which would be my case. I don't think anyone's going to turn this valley into a GMO free zone. It's full of GMOs. So there are not enough of us organic growers that our financial impacts outweigh the financial impact to all those people who are benefiting from growing GMO seeds. So just from the standpoint of you know, setting up areas where GMOs cannot enter. Well, if you're in a place where there are no GMOs, like, I don't know, some state where they don't grow Roundup Ready sugar beets or canola, then it might be easy to set up a GMO free zone. But in the seed production areas, I don't quite see how you do that. Uh, the other 
organic growers besides me are spread out all over the valley. We're not concentrated anywhere. I realize it looks different in Southern Oregon, but in a place where you already, where seeds are being grown, we are outnumbered. So anyway, those are just some sobering comments about what an uphill push this is. Um, I, I don't want to uh, keep throwing cold water on it, but one of the issues about uh, cisgenics is if you have a contamination event, you can't see it. <laughs> uh, or if you have, a, if, if there were crisper vegetables and they cross to your non-crisper vegetables, I do not think that it can be detected. So how would you detect the contamination? Anyway, I'm not the first one to think of these things, but these are issues that kind of slow the wheels. I know yeah. my hand may not be raised and I may be premature in my answer, but um, I do believe there is developing, and maybe the other guy who's a better scientist than me, is developing ways to uh, identify systemic crops. So it may be coming that that is possible. I'm not actually sure about that, but I have a, my memory serves me right. I think they're getting to that. For testing and traceability mechanism? Yes, I believe so. But I'd have to do some research to find out for sure. But the, and, and I wrote this cisgenic transition about a year and a half ago, and things changed so fast that I'm not keeping up all the time. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks, Frank. It's obviously really important um, and helpful to hear from a seeker on the ground. And I think a lot of these initiatives that have been launched, uh, some of which have, you know, not been successful as we know, I think they're really aiming to level this playing field as you described it, which is very much an uphill battle. And I think it is gonna take a diversity of strategies to get close to that, get close to leveling the playing field. And we certainly have our work cut out for us to get creative. Um, and I do think, I do believe strongly that it needs to start at least be complemented by the federal level, um, which for far too long, the federal regulations in my opinion, have, have not been adequate, um, which has left the states to try to fill in those holes from their patchwork system. So that's the task at hand. Are there other seed growers on the call uh, who wanna share their experience who either feel similarly to Frank who just spoke here from Wild Garden Seeds or, or maybe even disagrees? We'd love to hear other perspectives. Hiki? Yes. Well, this is Isaura. Um, well, I want to I want to say that I agree with Frank. Um, you know, I sat on that AC twenty one committee two times, and the first time around was talking about coexistence. And one of the things that that the committee looked at was these GE free zones. And and um, you know, if I guess in some states they have like areas where GE alfalfa can be planted, and I forget. I think the other one was canola. I can't remember what it was. But it's like Frank was saying, I mean, if you're an organic producer and you're only like one, you know, one little producer and you're sur completely surrounded by this GE free zone, then what, what do you do, you know? And the other thing is like, you can't be testing all of your crops. I mean, we actually had someone who did, who did a, an analysis, which we, we, I could give to everyone afterwards, post it somewhere, um, where, you know, basically you, you go bankrupt if you have to test, test your every, every single load that you have of corn or whatever it is. And that was one of the things that I had asked Vilsack, you know, back when he was under Obama administration was like, okay, like in New Mexico, you know, corn is corn for some, some, some indigenous people, like, you know, like Beat was talking about. I mean, those crops are sacred. And who's going to pay for the testing of, of, of our corns? And he never, ever responded to me, you know, because there is no, there is no solution for us, you know. Um, and also the, the thing about the GMO, GE confusion, that was something that like Chris was mentioning, genetically modified, it, the way, the way uh, uh, Genesis had explained to me was that everything, when you have like two, two plants and maybe um, someone else can talk about this, that you know, when, two, when two plants cross, they're genetically modified, but they're not genetically engineered. So genetic engineering is something that's not done in nature. 
Although now with some of these new techniques, they may argue that. But but that was that was a confusion that the biotechs used for us too. That they kept saying, "Oh, it's just genetically modified. It's been done for hundreds and thousands of years." No. So then we we even had campaign buttons that had GMO, no GMO chili, and then we changed it to no to you know no GE chili, and that's the the term that we've been using. And and like you know Amy was saying, transgenic is a term that's used in, in other countries, but a lot of people who don't don't understand that term. But I think it's really important to keep you know, the word GE or whatever else we may have to come up with, but be consistent with it. Thanks. Thank you, Isara. Is there a, an update on, on the Chile controversy that you're involved in that would be pertinent to this conversation? So what happened was uh, when we started, when, when and, and there was a lot of people that were involved with this, not just us, but um, we created a coalition mainly because we didn't know we didn't want anyone to be attacked. And uh, Percy Schmeiser had come and said, you know, it's better if you have a coalition instead of just, you know, just you know, single people. Uh, so what's happened with with the when we were trying to pass the Farmer Protection Act, we found out that we were mainly doing it because we found out that, that a genetic engineer Chile was being developed by New Mexico State University and they were going to own the patent on it. And then when we, we realized that New Mexico had been one of the one of the states where they had done trials, the GE alfalfa. So then we realized that it was a big danger for us because we have water rights. And so if, if someone was to get sued by Monsanto or one, or one of these other companies and they could take away your land and your water rights. So what's happened with the GE Chile, it's, it's still in trials. And what they did was they ended up passing the New Mexico Chile Association and the biotech people, they ended up passing a law first they would say that we could not call our chilies New Mexico and it was really hard to get far farmers to fight this because they were like well we don't call our chilies New Mexico because it because the uh, traditional farmers don't call it New Mexico they call it by where they where, where it comes from because it's been grown there for you know almost 500 years so it's, it's related to the region where you're where they're from and uh, then they came back and passed another law where they have now made it illegal for us to call it by its by its varietal names if it references any geographic area in New Mexico, which of course is what the what the chili peppers are all named after. They're named after the geographic area. So there, that still has not been, that law needs to be overturned is what needs to happen. And the New Mexico Chili Association has been trying to trademark New Mexico certified chili, but actually right now they're running into a block because uh, they New Mexico is being considered a variety by the trade by the trademark association office. And so, Right now, that's where we're at, Kiki. We just still have not been able to, to get that repealed. And also we asked them to tell us if you could do in trials, you should tell us where the trials are being done at and they, they won't, they refuse to do that. Thanks, Isara. Isara, can you, do? would you be okay with sharing a way to get in touch with you uh, in the chat box if folks that are on the line would like to follow up with you um, sure. about that? Yes, uh -huh. thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate your comments and, and you sharing about where where that struggle is right now with the, with the peppers. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hear that you all are in that position. I'm seeing, um, again, some really great conversation happening in the chat box. Um, wonderful. Isara has just added her uh, email address in there if you're interested in connecting with her and following up. Chris Hardy, I see your hand raised. Chris, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and share your comment? Yeah, hi, thanks all. Um... Yeah, this is Chris Hardy. I'm a seed grower in Southern Oregon. We have a seed company, Hardy Seeds. Uh, um, we, I, I was the guy who walked into a field of GMO sugar beets down here back in 2012 and, and discovered them and, and uh, picked up the phone and called our county and they said that we can't do anything about the, the Swiss multinational chemical company Syngenta growing next to you, you better call the ODA. And so we had to call the state and the state said, oh, that's out of our department. You need to talk to somebody at the FDA. And so uh, we got put in touch with somebody there and spoke with the deputy director and uh, whatever that, that oversees stuff like that. And they said, there's nothing they can really do because uh, uh, they, 
they were growing uh, uh, in our valley. And at that time, it was uh, the GE sugar beets were regulated under regulated status. And um, they said that they could look into it, but there was really nothing they could do uh, to, to, you know, they, they would, but they ended up sending out a couple investigators and um, the short end of it is that even though the Swiss multinational was here on 36 different GMO plots uh, growing right next to dozens of, of seed growers across our valley, uh, the, uh, even though they, they were not uh, the, the required four mile isolation distance from those farms, uh, uh, the, the uh, USDA found that the, the attorneys, the investigators that they sent out here to look into this found there was no uh, crime create, uh, caused by Syngenta. And it, it just, uh, it just was so remarkable that they could get away with this, um, even though uh, the Swiss company told us they were within uh, four mile isolation distance um, on at least two of our plots. And we, we ended up having to rip up one of our seed contracts with Fedco for uh, Swiss chard mm -hmm. um, because the company told us that they were within four mile isolation distance. So it, it basically was just sleight of hand and they, they just waved their magic wand and all these problems went away. And that's why we had to move forward with, with the crop ban down here in Southern Oregon because we knew that it was basically they were blowing smoke uh, uh, across all the growers here in the valley, just, just, just basically a bunch of BS that no harm was done. And, um, and then fast forward about a year later, no, God, what was it, Frank, in uh, July of 2012, I believe they fully deregulated the sugar beets, uh, the Roundup Ready sugar beet uh, H7-1. And so it made it official uh, at that point that the only way that you were going to do something uh, like, like the USDA eventually told me, they're like, look, we just recommend you call up Monsanto you call up Syngenta and you just do your best effort to try to work together. That's what we recommend. You work together and we saw coexistence fail here in Southern Oregon. Uh, when they finally, when Syngenta and the, the uh, Monsanto and the Farm Bureau sent an attorney from uh, Texas uh, to meet with 50 plus growers from our valley, we knew that coexistence had failed at that point because they they weren't were not going to disclose their secret locations, and uh, uh, and they just wanted to work on their terms. They were not good neighbors, like they were. They, they pumped up in our campaign. Down thirty here, seconds. Ban GMOs. They they said that they were good neighbors and they always worked with farmers. Never never had that problem. We saw that process of coexistence fail here in Southern Oregon. Thank you. And I can send the, the ordinance to anybody uh, who would like a copy of that ordinance. I'm not able to put the PDF up here. I guess you can't put attachments in. Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing those details with us. Um, if you feel comfortable, Chris, maybe you could pop your email in the chat box. And if folks are interested in getting that PDF, the ordinance, they can contact you directly. Would that be okay? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Kat. Thanks, Chris. I also want to just lift up some chat that's going on between Angela and Isaura in the chat here about um, about these trialing locations. Um, Angela asking, you know, the, why isn't there, why don't the companies have to disclose? Why isn't there some sort of a patent? Again, getting back to what Chris is describing that they experienced down in Southern Oregon. And um, Isaura is sharing that in New Mexico at the state level, that there's a law that per, is prohibiting the disclosure of where the GE, the GE trials are planted because biotech said it is to prevent the destruction of their fields. And I Chris, can, it, 
Oh, yeah, sorry. Go, go ahead. No, go ahead, Kat. I um, was going to ask Chris or some or um, someone based in Oregon who might know if a similar law is on the books in Oregon. There isn't a law on the books. I'll definitely let Chris chime in as well, but I will say that it, that this is what the industry and the Farm Bureau and other people in opposition to any sort of coexistence, increasing meaningful coexistence measures cites as a potential. So that certainly is used here. Um, and I will also, I meant to bring it up earlier, there was a bad uh, bent grass, genetically engineered bent grass escape um, that is causing problems in Eastern Oregon. And that was another emphasis for why this work needed to be done and also portends to why there should be better location information all the time, not just when there's an escape. Thank you, Amy. Kiki, did you wanna, did you wanna share some more details about that too? I, I can just give a broad brush stroke on the field trial piece. Ever since genetically engineered crops were introduced in 1996, it's been up to the developers of these new traits to simply notify the US Department of Agriculture that they were conducting these trials. The information that they provide is rather limited and uh, to audits uh, from the USDA's own Office of Inspector General has found that the USDA's oversight and even knowledge of the actual uh, locations of these trials are woefully inadequate. Um, and so that means that if a farmer, say, here in Montana, where I live, wanted to know if they were close to an experimental trial of unapproved genetically engineered wheat, say, they really can't get access to that information. Even our own state, to the best of my knowledge, can only um, access what county those trials are taking place in, um, access that information from the US Department of Ag. And so the lack of transparency is of course very concerning, especially since we're talking about traits that are at the experimental level, they haven't gone through any safety review, they haven't been approved for commercial production, and yet we know that in many cases it's impossible to, impossible to fully contain you know, what essentially is a, a living technology, if you will. And so uh, there are records, as we know, of escapes, including uh, genetically engineered wheat popping up in places um, where it shouldn't be. Uh, as many of you know, genetically engineered wheat is not approved for commercial growing and selling. And so the experimental field trial piece is certainly uh, a critical area in need of improvement. Unfortunately, the US Department of Ag updated its regulations governing agricultural biotechnology last year. They finally finalized uh, new rules for this regulatory framework for the first time since it was developed in the late 1980s, before many of these traits were even developed, um, when they were just starting conversations around what biotechnology was looking like in agriculture. Unfortunately, and this um, probably is unsurprising, unfortunately, these regulations are even weaker than the ones that were in place and that it's up to the developers of a new genetically engineered trait or organism to determine if they should be regulated at all. So it's it's switched over to this very um, like self-regulating system, which is problematic, especially when it comes to the experimental field trials piece, because it's up to the developer now to determine if they even need to disclose um, and notify the US Department of Ag of these experimental field trials. Um, as we know, some of these experimental field trial escapes have disrupted markets um, greatly. In 2006, it cost the long grain rice industry over a billion dollars because again, an experimental trait was found in the commercial rice supply headed to foreign markets. So I'll just stop there and I'm happy to share more um, in the chat box if people have specific questions. So Kiki, is there any, is it, is it a poor implementation or is it just literally the lack of coherent federal law? And has there been any attempts by anyone to create better law so that at least around the trialing aspect of knowing where these things are going on, it seems, seems kind of just basic that, that they should be tracking and knowing that. 
It's both, Jeff. And uh, again, there has been a lot of advocacy on this point in the context of providing public comments to the Federal Register for the USDA's past proposals for updating these rules, which, as I mentioned, they finally did last year. And so um, we are now left with, um, you know, even less transparency and oversight than we had before. And thank you. Yeah, I'll turn it over to people with hands raised, Kat. Thank you so much, Kiki. Um, I see, uh, Chris, I see your hand up, but I'm gonna go ahead and let Craig LaHoulier uh, comment first, uh, just cause you've already gone and then, and then you'll be up next. Craig, if you could just um, introduce yourself and unmute yourself and share your comment. Sure, um, so great to be here. Uh, greetings from Western North Carolina. Um, name is Craig LaHoulier, a, uh, Gosh, a seed saver for about the last 40 years, amateur tomato breeder. And um, one, so I have been involved with the Seed Savers Exchange for a long time. And, you know, we've got seed samples sitting in the Svalsbad vault. And so we need these standards of varieties that are pure. How and where is the firepower coming from people who are concerned with keeping germplasm free and clear so that it can be used in the future without being polluted is does seed savers exchange are they heavily involved in this game because it seems like they should be um it, it's very concerning as a seed saver to hear um this talk and you know speaking to a lot of gardeners there's masses of confusion uh between gmos between ge's and people they're afraid of things they don't even know how to call what they're afraid of so uh, I guess I'm just kind of concerned that we don't have enough skin in the game because as I'm listening to Chris and all these other, I'm thinking of a big dollar sign. It's all about money, money and power. And so I'm thinking, how do we neutralize that for our side, for people who want to keep these things um, not engineered so that, you know, in 50 years, we can grow a certain variety of wheat or a variety of broccoli and not have a zillion different genes spliced into them. So I'm frustrated. I'm encouraged hearing all of the passion and the intellect on this call, but I'm frustrated with what the way forward is. And that's really all I wanted to say. Craig, thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. Um, I not sure that I'm scanning correctly, but I'm, I don't see, I don't know. Is anybody from Seed Savers Exchange on the line who might want to share or respond to Craig's, Craig's comment? I don't think there is anybody on, but Craig, I, I'd love to follow up with you afterwards to, to talk more about, um, uh, you know, in, engaging the in situ conservationists um, and the gardening folks into these conversations and and um, and the policy platform and the coalition that we mentioned this listening session is part of. So I will be in touch with you. Uh, Chris Hardy, do you want to go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and make your next comment? Oh uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. I wanted to mention that I, uh, I went back to the site where Syngenta said they would stop growing because it was, was close to us, uh, unlike the other site where they planted, even though we had a seed contract. Uh, the site that was virtually right in the city of Ashland where they were growing, uh, we went back a year later. I went back there with a filmmaker uh, who was uh, doing a film on seeds. And uh, we walked through this field where the GE sugar beets had uh, been growing by the Swiss company to produce seed crops. Those seeds uh, were, uh, those seeds had been scattered all over the ground and were growing uh, very healthy looking sugar beets. So um, uh, I'd really like to just share that, that that it was a shock to, to see how healthy those sugar beets were. Um, and, you know, conversation that I've had with Frank uh, uh, Morton, there's a company that in Oregon that actually had a positive test of, of contamination of one of their seed lots for betas. And, uh, and they didn't want to tell anybody be about it and because it was just bad PR. So it's, you know, and, and uh, I can't remember how the story goes. Maybe Frank would share about the, 
the pile of sugar beet seeds that were discarded off over on the side of some compost pile that had uh, sprouted up and and uh, th those I I can't remember the rest of the story of how those made it out into the uh, contaminating somebody. Uh, sure. Um, well, first of all, Chris, you're exactly right. Uh, wherever they grow these things, the next year they're coming up as volunteers. And guess what? You can't spray them out with Roundup. Um, so you have to use something stronger. That is a huge issue. <clears throat> uh, basically, they are very bad housekeepers, even though I believe that the industry is trying to pick up after themselves, but it's just like everything else. Um, people make mistakes. The case that Chris is referring to is that um, one of the sugar beet companies had a whole bunch of leftover potting soil, uh, leftover from their steckling production. Stecklings are little baby sugar beets that are transplanted out. And um, they had just a lot of, you know, soil and leftover sugar beet roots that were in this, um, basically a soil mix. And that ended up going to a landscaping company where it was mixed in with their compost. So if you bought compost from this company, you were buying compost that was full of sugar beet seeds and sugar beet roots even. Okay, well, a sharp-eyed friend of mine actually saw this and took me there and I collected some of the roots and we had them identified as genetically engineered roots. Okay, well, this caused the industry a lot of embarrassment, but that's all. It made it on the front page of the local paper, but that's all. Nothing came of it. Uh, they were told to do better next time. <laughs> and so that's pretty much what happened. But those sugar beets got spread all over the county in that event. So essentially, they're not very good housekeepers, and we are left to defend ourselves because, as uh, Craig said, it's where the money is. We don't have enough money on the table to turn anybody's head, is the way I feel. They are all bigger than us. In a democracy, numbers count. If only a couple of people are growing organic seeds, or if only a few people care about cross-contamination, well, in essence, in, in my experience, I'm just outvoted. It's like, yeah, we, we need to do better than that. Next issue. It's not taken seriously. So, uh, you can, you can make it more serious by bringing a lawsuit. You can try to. I don't know. But, you know, I personally have not been contaminated. So I personally can't bring a lawsuit. Um, the company that Chris referred to, hell, the name is Universal Seed Company. Uh, they're the biggest uh, seed company in the Valley other than the sugar beet growers. They had a $1.5 million contract for some high-priced chard seed that was supposed to go to Europe. And of course, it was flagged as being hot with sugar beet traits. And they lost a million and a half dollars. And I asked the owner of the company, who's kind of a friend of mine, why aren't you making a big stink about this? Why aren't you suing about this? And he says, Frank, because I have to work with these people. I have to dance with them. I have to share fields and rotate with them. Uh, so to bring a lawsuit against the people he has to cooperate with did not seem like a good business decision to him. To him, writing off a million and a half dollar seed contract due to a cross-contamination, he says, Frank, cross-contamination happens all the time. It wouldn't matter if it was a Roundup Ready sugar beet or your stupid chard. If your chart got into my seat, I would have lost a million and a half dollars. So 
they don't see it in this region where we grow a lot of seed. They don't see the contamination by uh, GMOs or GE traits is any different than being contaminated by an organic farmer down the road who's growing, you know, red chard while they're trying to grow white beets, you know, and that's their attitude. It's all 30 seconds to them. It's all contamination and they don't want any contamination period. And so that takes the issue off the table. Thank you, Frank, for sharing those important perspectives. It's very frustrating. <laughs> it's very frustrating. Um, my head has all kinds of bruises on it from banging it against this wall. I can imagine it does. Kat, I'm going to jump in here really quick and just tell folks we have about 10 minutes left in this conversation. Thank you so much, everyone who's provided comments verbally, um, as well as in the chat box. Um, before we get to um, a couple of final comments, I'm popping the survey into the chat box. It's quite short. We hope you'll take a minute to respond to it um, after the call. There's also an opportunity to share your name and email address if you want it to be shared with other people on this call who also have opted in to share their name and contact information as a way to keep these conversations going among yourselves. So that is part of the survey as is just getting some quick feedback on, on how today's event went. Um, also an opportunity to stay engaged with the groups co-hosting today. So, um, oops, I did not share that with everyone. Give me a minute here. I'm gonna pop it in again here. There's a survey, it's a survey monkey link. Thank you again for taking a minute to respond to that. Um, Jason, you can go to the last slide before taking any final comments. I also wanted to draw your attention to this publication uh, by NCAT, Genetically Modified Crops, transgenic, Transgenics and Cisgenics. Jeff Shazinski with NCAT, who has participated in the conversation today, is one of the co-authors. I'll pop that link into the chat box as well. Um, it's a great resource, check it out. It was just updated um, in 2018. The topics are changing quickly, but it is rather up to date. So thank you, Jeff, for that great publication. Kat, we have a few more minutes if you see any hands or conversations in the chat box that are worth lifting up at this time. I We'll give a final call for hands, um, or if you're having a hard time finding the raise hand function, you can note that in the comments and um, I'll put you in the queue. Uh, I will add as well, Kiki just mentioned NCAT's publication. She put it in the chat. We'll be following up with an email to everybody on today's call with some additional resources and some of the resources that we talked about um, and that have been coming up on the call. Uh, and you will be sending that out later this week. Um, there is, I did note, Somebody mentioned a book that I too recently read called The Scientist and the Spy. Um, it's a, I, a, also provides some sobering context of just how um, dollar signed these issues are, as Frank mentions. So I am not seeing any additional hands raised. I'm not seeing any additional comments. Um, so I think that we are at a stopping point for today's listening. We have one. Oh. Great, go ahead. Um, yeah. Welcome, go ahead and introduce yourself and love to hear from you. Yeah, well, um, I can't uh, help from uh, mentioning something. Uh, you know, I'm from Europe and I'm really, what well, kind of upset uh, uh, with what I hear uh, this evening? Uh, for me, it is evening, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, uh, uh, we are in uh, organic maize uh, seed production in Europe, uh, but we also have to test uh, on GMO for uh, before exporting uh, lots. Uh, but we are still uh, quite, uh, well, feeling safe 
um, uh, on production because Europe uh, is a, a GMO free uh, uh, area, of course. Um, well, all I can say from here is keep up your good work. Um, I'm really, really impressed uh, by all of you uh, whom I've heard for uh, keeping organic, um, uh, working against that money-driven um, seed companies uh, who feel no responsibility uh, at all for uh, their uh, introductions to the market. And um, I, um, I, I need to be updated <laughs> by by all of you. Um, um, I won't. Uh, I'm not sure if we stay uh, GMO free, a uh, gene um, editing crops uh, free uh, in Europe. So um, please keep me updated. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Grit. And if you, um, to keep you updated, uh, in that survey uh, that Kiki mentioned in the chat box, there is an opportunity to sign up for um, newsletters and follow up uh, conversations from all of the co-hosts. So uh, we promise not to sell anybody's information. We never do share, uh, <laughs> but that, there's an opportunity to sign up for that there. Wonderful. All Thank right. you. Thank you. Well, I think though there is some still a little bit of chatter and looks like some folks signing off in the chat box that we are going to wrap up today's session. Thank you again to all of our co-hosts, um, to NCAT running the technology today, but most importantly to everybody who joined today's listening session and provided comments and um, questions and support for one another. Um, I don't know if we just threw, I don't, I don't know if we threw too much cold water on the fire as Frank mentioned, but, um, we will be in touch with some follow-up details. Kiki, do you have anything else to add? No, just thank you so much again to our co-hosts, as you said, Kat, and to everyone who joined. We really want this to be an ongoing conversation and we are committed to developing these policy platforms and right. making them as participatory as possible. So, um, we hope to stay engaged with many of you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Wait.